Welcome to the suburbs with Andy and Greg. Over the years, I've had crisis after crisis after crisis that I've navigated through. One, I recall, it was at church, Easter Sunday, one of the biggest days of the year, of course. Back then, we used to run all of our music via a laptop and music sequencing software that would play back the instruments, and then you could add musicians to that, but the core of the track was sequences. And the band leader dumped a cup of coffee into his laptop 30 minutes before the service began. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm flashing to right now is Millie Vanilli. I'm I'm just yeah. I'm flashing the <laughs> yeah. Millie Vanilli in concert. Sure. And they're lip syncing. And then all of a sudden that guy that you're talking about spills his coffee into the laptop and suddenly the music stops, but they're still dancing and moving their mouths. Show's over. <laughs> <laughs> Our workaround was one of the other people at the church had a laptop. I thought you were going to say had a puppet show, <laughs> had a puppet show in the trunk of his car. <laughs> Just that moment when that cup of coffee went into the laptop was a sinking feeling. Yeah, literally. Yes. <laughs> the other one I recall was <laughs> back in 1983, I was one of the engineers on John Mellencamp's crumbling down session at TRC Studios. The console that we used had this little quirk of sorts. There was something in the patch bay. When you pulled a patch cord or inserted a patch cord that caused the console to lock up. And the only workaround was to pull all the modules out of the console and reseat them. What does that mean? If you had a 36 input console, you have 36 identical channel strips that slide out of the console and can be inserted back in. Okay. We were pulling all the modules out of the console because the guest engineer hit the magic button and shut the thing down. And John <laughs> Mellencamp walks in with us pulling the modules out of the console. Sort of had this, what the hell is going on? <laughs> Look. Immediately gets a cigarette out. <laughs> oh, we'll just be a minute. No big deal. <laughs> Just a look on his face, like, what the hell are these guys doing? <laughs> like, you know, this is the most high-profile session we had ever done. Yeah. And we were doing this workaround to get past the recording console's uh, failure. But we got everything mounted and reseated and back up and running. So did you do anything fun this week? I had to have my braces tightened this week, and I didn't want to tell my mom because she'll obsess over it. And, like, she'll be ready with her bag packed what's in the bag is anybody's guess i mean it could be like <laughs> 12 pairs of socks <laughs> and that's it like nothing else her clock radio right her collection of four and or eight track tapes and 12 pairs of socks and deep snow dvds <laughs> can't forget those no and so i thought okay i'm not gonna say anything until right before we go which was on the fourth we were gonna head back to indy then I was going to have my braces tightened uh, and go straight from that to the dealership that was going to put new brake pads on my truck. That was going to be done. And then we were going to head back to the lake. So phase one, braces tightening, off without a hitch. I go to the dealership. I give them my truck. I say, look, my mom's got health care appointments tomorrow in northern Indiana. I have to have this back and done today. So it's just brake pads. I want to let you know, so we cover this base, I need this truck back. I need this truck back tonight. And he said, okay, let me check with the tech. So he goes back. And again, car dealership, not Schmo's repair <laughs> service. Bob's break and tow. Yeah, right. Bob's broken tow. <laughs> so he comes back and he goes, yep, we're going to get you in. And it's just brake pads, so we'll have you done. I'll send you a text. I said, okay. So he sends me a text at 4 and says, um, we're not going to be done with this until tomorrow morning. And I said, we had a conversation. And that conversation included me getting this back so that I could be in northern Indiana tomorrow morning for my mom's health care appointments. And he's like, yeah, I know we did but it's not going to be done until tomorrow. And I said, okay, I need a loaner. 
And he goes, I can't authorize that. And I said, I need to talk to somebody that will get me a loaner. Roger Penske? <laughs> and he comes back and he says, since it's just brake pads, the service manager says that we'll rent you a car for $45 a day. I said, uh -oh. I've bought cars from you going back decades. The two cars that we have in our family right now, I bought from you guys. Renting me a car for $45 a day is like a smack in the face. Insult. It's totally an insult. I'm not mad at you. I realize that you're just a messenger. So when I say this to him, you know how he takes it is? My job doesn't count. I'm just a messenger. <laughs> That's what, that's what he hears. That's what he gets out of it. <laughs> Listen, moron. I know I'm just a messenger. <laughs> that's not what I said. I talked to the service manager and I said, look, man, this is what I needed. I explained everything up front. And now you're saying $45? Look, I've been in sales my entire life. And I'm only as good as the service that stands behind me. And the $45 feels like a total smack in the face. Look, have you ever been in a situation where you're a caregiver? It's not like I want to go skiing or, you know, some other frivolous thing. It's I've got healthcare appointments for a person that needs them. I have to be in the northern part of the state. Did you have some uh, violin music in the background as you told your story? So I had two things playing in my mind at that time. <laughs> and one is being my advocate and like standing up for myself. And the other is, you sound like such a whiner right now. I mean, like <laughs> the other, the other alter ego Greg is on my shoulder going, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> and I'm not sure which one was right at the time. I heard myself saying, Am I the kind of customer that trades in his vehicle every two years with you? No, man. Look, I'm just a guy trying to get things done, trying to move the ball forward. And we buy from you guys. And my whole idea was to put my trust in you when it comes to things like brake pads. And so I did. And now you want to charge me to use a lease vehicle? I can't get on board with that. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, and then you, you put into it, you know, all of this healthcare stuff that's going on in the background and a career where everybody's now gone. I can start to see why the guy climbs up in the clock tower. I can see where that guy <laughs> snapped. <laughs> I'm not there. I'm not ever going to be there. The crosshairs. <laughs> I get it. Our front door, our security door lock failed. My locksmith came over and got the door open and said, okay, you just need to replace the locking mechanism. I went to Lowe's where I bought the door. They still sell those doors and they still sell those locks. And they said, it's going to be about three weeks. And so we were waiting three weeks and three weeks came and went. And I got a phone call, went on vacation from the guy at Lowe's. And he said, I just want to call and check on your pickup, see how it all went. I said, well, I don't have the thing. And I'm like, well, it says right here you picked it up. It's in two RCA connectors. I'm like, okay, well, we're way off base here. <laughs> this is a lock for a storm door. Somehow their system like cross pollinated that order with this order. And hey, I'm just calling to check to see how that pickup went. As opposed to your door playing music while you launch fireworks <laughs> or something. We got past the, oh, I say, oh, yeah, you have a door lock on order. And I said, well, where is it? And I said, well, let's see. It was signed for by H. Smith. And you know, we don't have an H. Smith here. <laughs> You're not making me feel any better. And this is right before the holidays. So I'll get with my vendor after the holidays. And and they got a hold of them and they were going to, okay, now we're going to order another lock because it's lost. Nobody's accountable and FedEx won't fess up to it. As far as they're concerned, it's been delivered. Fingers are like pointing at it. Oh, yeah. H. Smith has a working door lock. <laughs> Harry Smith. Yeah. So then I went into sort of attack mode saying, you know, this is not my fault. You know, we've waited patiently. You've had my money. So what was your tone? Was your voice louder? I was angry customer in that moment because I was angry. And so I gave him my whole diatribe about how I'm the customer and you've had my money and we don't have a lock. Uh -huh. We've waited three weeks and now you're telling me we don't have it. Now we got to start all over again. I said, mm -hmm. you need to get this thing ordered. You need to FedEx it to me. Mm -hmm. I don't have that kind of authority. You know what they say in a negotiation like that? 
they say that the most effective way of doing it is to assume the voice of an evening FM disc jockey. I could do that. I know you can. That's right. Next time that you need a lock, don't click into angry customer. Hey, this is Andy. It's 11 p.m. on Monday night. This is hot-blooded by Horner. And where's my lock? <laughs> right. <laughs> Have you ever done a pitch to get out of a ticket? Yes. When I bought my Acura and traded in my Xterra. You're a name dropper. I am. Did you notice you were just name dropping like crazy? <laughs> well, that was the sound you heard on the floor, all those names hitting the ground. <laughs> so I'm driving through the streets of Zionsville, probably going 33 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone. And the lights come on, come to a screeching halt. Hands on the steering wheel window down, doing all the things you're supposed to do when you're stopped by the police, not rummaging through the glove compartment. <laughs> For the bottle of scope. <laughs> yeah, right. Or the handgun. And so up comes this female officer and she's, you realize how fast you're going, you know, whatever I was. And okay, yes, yes, yes. Let me see your registration and insurance card. So you didn't say nice knockers or anything? <laughs> no, Eyes forward. <laughs> yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Okay. And so hand of the registration. What are your pronouns? <laughs> right. <That's> what he... <laughs> Looking at my registration, she goes, well, this isn't an Xterra. I said, no, I, I just traded in an Xterra. She goes, well, your registration says Xterra. I'm like, you're right. <laughs> I, I thought, uh-oh, I never registered the new car. Oh, well, isn't that the dealership? Don't they do that? Well, here's the story. We bought the car from one of Jennifer's friend's husband, who was the Acura dealer. And he came down to the studio to do the closing, brought paperwork and whatnot, but didn't bring back the registration paperwork, apparently. Since I don't buy cars every six months, it just was, didn't cross my mind. I needed to register the vehicle. <laughs> so she was nice enough to say, okay, well, in 10 days, you need to fax over your registration and let me go with a warning on the speeding and said, just fax me the registration to show that you registered this vehicle, which I did. And the other side story to this is when I closed on this car, he came down and Jennifer came down. It was an anniversary present. Oh, nice. Wow. And I thought our dinner on the 33rd anniversary was a good deal, but man, you get a new car. <laughs> <laughs> the guy has all of his stuff to go and, and Jennifer, you know, she's a tyrant with numbers and she's like, well, this price is higher than what we agreed upon. And she's like, it's like $25 more. He goes, well, that's for the hat. Well, you, you're charging me for the hat? Well, well it's $25. He's like, okay, whatever, because they, I'd ask for an accurate hat out of the deal. I can't believe that's a line item. Jennifer told her coworker at work about this situation, and she raised hell with her husband. You freaking charged him for a hat? He just bought this $40,000 car. <laughs> And so then I get in the mail, like a big book of car washes and oil changes as a <laughs> consolation prize for this hat he charged me $25 for. A rebate on the hat. Man, you would think a guy that's in sales would be more aware, you know, when it comes to public and personalities. That's a guy that doesn't normally interact with the public kind of move. It's just a bonehead move. I don't know why he would even consider charging me. I mean, it wasn't like it was a hoopty that I was buying. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a couple of pulled over by the police stories. I'm the kind of guy that... It doesn't matter what my story is when I get pulled over, I'm getting the ticket. My wife could be in labor in the passenger seat, and I've got the guy that just needs to die on that hill, and he's going to give me a ticket regardless of whether the fact that she's got a baby's head coming out <laughs> in the passenger seat. <laughs> the officer, she's crowning. Yeah. I don't care what kind of royalty you're from, you're still getting the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> so conservation officers have more authority than even a state police officer in the state of Indiana. I don't know about other states. Did not know that. Yeah, because water is different than roads. Thanks for that tidbit, Mr. Obvious. <laughs> <laughs> so they can pull you over on a road or water, and apparently state police can't. Back to the 10-page letter guy again. We're fishing together. We're in this Indiana State Forest that used to be all coal strip mining, and they reclaimed the area. It's now a forest with a bunch of lakes, 
and it's really good fishing. So we're going to move from one lake to another. And as we're on the ramp to pull the boat out, here comes this conservation officer in one of these six wheel amphibious vehicles with like a trolling motor mounted on the front. So he can just drive down into the water, put the trolling motor on and cruise on to go harass fishermen. And he comes up to me as we're on the ramp. I see him coming. So I've got my license out. And so Scott looks at me and he goes, you don't even know that he was going to ask for that. I go, that's what, what's he coming over to talk about the weather? <laughs> of course he's coming up. So he looks at it. Ask you if you had a cigarette. Yeah, right. <laughs> you two got a Marlboro. <laughs> so he looks at it and he goes, oh, uh, this is last year's fishing license. Here we go. And I go, oh, okay. So I go back into the same pouch uh, in my wallet where I keep my fishing license and I pull out another one. And he looks at it and he goes, this is last year's fishing license too. I go, what? <laughs> he goes, yeah. And I said, okay, well, wait a minute. I just, because you cross a threshold in April of having to buy, I don't know why they wait till April. They didn't used to, but you have to buy a new license for the new year in April. So I had just done it. I said, I know I just did this. And he goes, yeah, this says that you bought it last week. And I go, yeah, I did. And he goes, but you bought last year's. I go, what? So you should have asked him for a pen and then just change the numbers. Yeah. Better now. <laughs> I said, how can I buy last year's license for this year? And, and just doesn't even care. He goes, well, it's an option. Do you want fries with that? <laughs> I go, but <laughs> you can see... I bought last year's. I mean, who would think that you could buy a worthless license? It's a discount. <laughs> I said, I was doing the right thing. And he goes, well, hold on a minute. So he calls. Ghostbusters? <laughs> he calls a number, talks to the person, calls back and says, yeah, you definitely bought last year's license last week. And so I'm going to have to write you a ticket. I go, are you kidding? And I, I just was like incensed at that point. You should have used your FM DJ voice. <laughs> Spinning the hits. <laughs> That's right. Hey, and after this is foreigners, hot blooded. <laughs> so you were non-compliant at that point in his eyes. Well, yeah, legally, I was non-compliant and, and emotionally I was non-compliant. <laughs> and so he said, yeah, I'm going to write you a ticket. And I said, but you can see that I was deranged, right? <laughs> was obviously full intention of being legal. This is, this is like a glitch in your system that would allow me to do this. And he's like, okay, I tell you what, if you go down and get a new license and fax me the license this week, I'll tear up the ticket. I'm like, okay. So I go on my lunch hour down to the state office building because I was working at the time pretty close to there, walk into the DNR, show them both tickets. And I said, I bought this ticket 10 days ago or whatever, meant to buy this year's license. Mm -hmm. Sugar, you out of luck. I was like, what? <laughs> mm -hmm. You need to buy a new ticket. No, we can't do that. I go, but I was intending to buy this year's license. Intent is one tenth of the law. <laughs> Yeah, apparently. And she's like, no, we can't do that. Okay. Do you have a supervisor that I can talk to? Yeah. But she's going to tell you the same thing. This is like the stereotype of state offices. None of them want to get up and walk to the counter. <laughs> Other than that one visit to actually look at my license, they're talking to me from their desk. Across the room. Yes. And so eventually the supervisor comes and I explain my situation. Come on, look, both both license. Why would somebody do this? She goes, well, I'm not supposed to do this, but come on up. So I got to go to her office. She got me the right license and didn't charge me for it. But I had to, again, story number two of you got to go over the person's head to the next person up the food chain to get what you want. And I faxed the guy in this day and age. I would take a picture with my phone and maybe text it to him. But at the time, I had to fax the guy to get out of the ticket. The guy that was with me, the 10-page letter guy, Scott, I was with him, and we had been to a club, 
The clubs had closed. He's a guy that needs to eat a sandwich after the clubs close. And so he's like, I got to get something. So we go to Wendy's name dropper. He gets his order. He pulls out onto the road. We're driving. And all of a sudden the lights are on and we're being pulled over. Sick feeling. Yeah. And he said, do you know why I pulled you over? And Scott said, no, I don't, but it might've been swerving because I was eating a chicken sandwich and driving with my knee. <laughs> and the guy goes, it was swerving. You were eating a chicken sandwich and driving with your knee. And he goes, yeah. Can I see your license? And he looked at the license and then said, okay, use both hands on the wheel and let him go. Like didn't give him a breathalyzer test. Didn't question him. He didn't have to do any faxing to get out of the tickets. <laughs> Had he been drinking? Well, yeah, he'd been drinking. That was his lucky day. I think he had paced himself. We weren't hammered. Hammered is is never a good place to be anyway. It doesn't take much, though. Right. To be 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8. That's the scary thing. I'm sure he would have failed. And you could have finished his chicken sandwich for him as he was hauled away. <laughs> yeah. Tastes like chicken. <laughs> is it pescatarian? Politarian. Politarian. Oh, polit. That's right. Now there's a new one. A Segan. Have you heard that one before? Segan? No. Segan, that is a vegan that will eat seafood. A vegan that'll eat seafood. A Segan. Hmm, okay. What's your pronoun? Segan. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is Andy. If you enjoyed listening to our podcast, please be sure to subscribe and share. Remember, laughter is contagious. Help us spread it by telling a friend.